If you know how to play Malifaux Second Edition, you more or less already know everything complicated about the Mal uh, through the breach deck. Everything that you used in Second Edition is more or less translatable. All the statistics, you know, your defense, your willpower, your movement speed. Howdy, friends. I got a chance to sit down with uh, Michael Kasevin, better known as the Dead Aussie Gamer. We talked a lot about Through the Breach. Now, he's a professional GM out of Western Australia. Uh, like Third Floor Wars, he's partnering with Weird uh, for content for Gen Con. He does an incredible job of explaining why he loves Through the Breach so much. I will warn you ahead of time, it is going to be difficult not to want to play this game after you hear him talk about it. He gives some great uh, tips and tricks for people that are new to role playing, new to Through to the Breach. Um, we have a whole segment about uh, how to become a GM and how to become a better game master. He has an amazing story about uh, an instance where he had a 15 year old kid who was a player in his game that had cheated and read the module he was running behind his back. It's interesting how he handled that. Tons of great advice, a great overview of the Through the Breach game. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Enjoy! Playing a tabletop strategy game allows you to unplug and test your skills against friends. Every week, Third Floor Wars delivers useful strategies, discussions, battle reports, and reviews to tabletop games like Malifaux. If you want to get better at the games you already play or discover the games other people are playing, you are in the right place. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk broadcast. Craig here on the third floor. My guest today is Michael Kasevin, better known as the Dead Aussie Gamer on YouTube. He's a professional game master from Perth, Western Australia. Now, some of you may know him from his great actual play videos and streams of Weird's Through the Breach role-playing game. So, Michael, welcome to the third floor. Thanks for having us, man. Uh, great to be here. So there was a day, it's not today, but there was a day where Michael did not know what role-playing was, did not know what tabletop gaming was, and then there was the day after that that you did know. So how did you find out about role-playing and tabletop gaming? Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that does take me back a few years. Uh, not too many years. Um, but, uh, um, so, so long time, a long, long time ago, uh, uh, just out of high school, I, I was very much into video games, right? Like any, even role playing video games, you know, were, were really kind of my wheelhouse. Um, I've been a gamer since I was, you know, a wee kid, uh, I used to play things like, you know, Duke Nukem and, for those of you who are as old as I am, Blackheart, which was one of the original Blizzard yeah. kind of uh, side scrollers, um, and uh, and role playing games like Baldur's Gate and stuff were always on my on my list. You know, um, I didn't even realize that there was a tabletop version of these games. I, I I felt like such an idiot when people told me about them, and I was like, "You mean the video game, right?" It's like, "No, no, tabletop role playing." I was like, "No, I've played it. I've played it. Icewind Dale. I know all of this stuff. You know, like I've played it before." No, no, you haven't. It's a tabletop yeah. role playing. Um, so after making an idiot of myself, my uh, my girlfriend, who uh, is actually still my partner of uh, of now going on eleven plus years, um, uh, she introduced me to my very first game. Um, having sat me down and uh, run me through the Pool of Radiance expansion, which wow. of course, for those of you who uh, who again uh, played the old Pool of Radiance um, video game, uh, actually did come with a supplementary. Uh, RPG adventure, which takes place along the same side. So for me, it was a trick, you know, because she said, hey, you know, would you want to play Pool of Radiance? And I, I geeked out. I was like, yes. Oh, my God. I haven't played that game in so long. And then it's like, OK, where's your, where's your, where's, where's your computer? I brought mine. And she's like, no, no, no. Sit down. And I was like, <laughs> ah. I was tricked. I was lulled into a false sense of security. But I, you know what? I regret nothing. It was an amazing time. And she was a fantastic GM. Nice. Uh, and uh, and now she's she she still actually has her mind blown about the fact that I've made a career of this, yeah. Uh, given that she's the one who introduced me, um, but yeah, that was my uh, that was my very very first introduction, being tricked into uh, to enjoying and loving role playing games. 
Well, and, and a lot of people don't realize it because they're not as old as I am, let alone uh, as young and old as you are. But like the online role playing games like Baldur's Gate and stuff like that, that that was all based off of people who were playing tabletop games. Right. So the, the, mm-hmm. what they did is they tried to translate second edition D&D to video games. Right. So that's what happened. Those took off. And because role playing has become a lot more common, a lot more recognized and uh, a lot more popular, people don't realize back, you know, 30 years ago how like underground role playing was. Even even something as big as Dungeon and Dragons was very underground. So it doesn't surprise me that uh it was brand new to you at some point because you know, I think it was to everybody. Um so obviously your experience with her was a good one. Mm. what followed up like what when did that may have like you know put the bait out there but what set the hook when did you finally decide like this is what i really like doing so um okay so i i believe myself to be one of these undiagnosed add kind of people so when i when i find something i tend to i tend to go a bit too far with things so once she put that hook in um it was like a second later that i thought i thought to myself i can gm which, of course, you know, those of you who have been down that road know that's not quite the case. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, so I, I literally poured through what must have been 30 books, like cover to cover, three or four times each, memorizing every single word, every single thing that happened, and wrote my very, very first game. Um, the thing that I found at the end of that, though, was, first of all, Um, that amount of time only making for a two hour game was insane. Um, and the second thing was that, um, I loved every second of the process. I, at no point did I find myself getting bored of reading, uh, or, or bored of like designing these creatures and these monsters. Um, it, it was almost like I was unfolding a movie from my head into this, into this space. And, and that just, for me was just the, the moment I fell in love with it. It was just this such a visceral expression of my creativity in a forum where um, the people I care about the most can express their uh, admiration of it or or their love of what I've done uh, and enjoy it um, in a, in a very tactile way. Yep. No, completely get that. So guys, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk and learn from Michael about uh, specifically weird through the breach role playing, which uh, you guys have heard me talk about on the show before. I own it. I have never played it. Um, I'm very tickled uh, by the setting, obviously being a a Malifaux player. Um, But the mechanics are something that I'm also interested in and uh, very anxious to talk to somebody who is experienced with it. So we're also going to talk about being a game master and role playing in general. Um, Michael is, has a very unique perspective on it, um, both in the breadth of games that he's played and actually being a content creator and, uh, a professional GM. So that's actually Michael, where I want to start, because when you and I first were connected by weird and started chatting, I found out, which I didn't know before that you actually make your living at this, which there's other people that make their living as GMs, but your situation is unique because it's actually the Australian government that pays you. Is that not correct? Uh, yep, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So, um, so what what does that look like? Uh, well, actually, yeah, first of all, it's a lot of phone calls from 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 adults who, who pretty much say, "So, what is a uh, a government dungeon master?" Because that sounds pretty weird. Um, I I try to usually trick them by telling them, "Yeah, well, if you don't pay your taxes, um, <laughs> no." Uh, so, um, so yeah, what I actually do is. Um, is a is an offshoot of youth work basically. Um, I run games out of uh, a youth center for young adults who want to get into you know sort of different hobbies and the like. And I am quote unquote our geek, according to my fellow coworkers. And uh, what I basically do is I promote uh, positive, enriching, and um, good practices for all kinds of gaming. I specialize in role playing games, but I've also done like video games and things like that. Um, yeah. a mix of not only teaching the young young people how to get into these games and how to enjoy it and how to behave, but also talking to parents and helping alleviate some concerns with things that might end up being like a, a gap of knowledge. Because a lot of parents don't understand what, or, you know, hey, my kid plays, plays Fortnite for 12 hours a day. I don't know how to communicate with them. What do I do? And, you know, yeah. I'll get a call and, and we'll, we'll, you know, sit down and have a chat with either the adult or the adult and the young person and, you know, kind of figure out, um, figure out where the, the line needs to be. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my, that's my primary job. And then obviously 
uh, from there, everything else more or less stems from. So I've um, just recently released, um, and I'm trying to think of when, depending on when we released this, and I think it's be two weeks ago, we released an episode that was about, I had parents um, who I interviewed, and then I interviewed their kids, and their parents that are gamers and kids that are gamers. And one of the subjects that we talked a good bit about, which you, I'm sure, know a lot about, is some really important skill sets that you can pick up at a young age from gaming, whether it be role playing, whether it be tabletop gaming or even video gaming. Um, and it's something that I think became a bit of a subject matter on that episode. So in your mind, Michael, what are, what do you think are some of like, if I'm a parent and I come to you and say, you know, why should my kid play role playing game? He's 15 years old. What is he going to get out of it? What do you think are some of the, you know, the key things that, that role playing specifically teaches somebody who's 12, 13, 14, 15 years old? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think some of the key things that young people learn from role-playing games um, include not only some basic skills, which, of course, just help you in all fields, such as, you know, mathematics, English, reading and writing skills. These are kind of the big, broad strokes that, you know, you'll hear a lot. But more importantly, um, currently we live in an age where society and the way that we interact and communicate is constantly changing and developing at such a rapid pace that um, the bridge in age now isn't just in, in terms of just experience and culture, but just the breadth in which we learn to socialize. Yeah. Young people um, now connect more with a screen than they do with each other. And um, role-playing games, uh, when you're at a tabletop situation, encourages a lot of that face-to-face. This expands into skills that they are going to be able to take into the real world. I mean, sure, many people are out there and have the um, the absolute um, privilege of being able to work and function um, in a job that allows them to work in the digital space. You'll find a lot of young people thrive in that situation. But then flipping onto the other side of the field where society needs more face-to-face kind of value, a lot of social skills uh, have slowly started to become stunted. And role-playing um, with these kids have slowly started to reintroduce this notion. Um, now, I've got a kind of a, I guess, a long-winded speech about education systems and things like that. But the, the crux of it is that we, in the schooling system, will learn how to, how to educate young people uh, in, a, in, in almost like an industrial way. You know, the way we do tests, the way we, you know, kind of uh, associate with these sort of things, heads down, do your work, etc., But as we forge further and further into the future, um, there is such a huge emphasis on the idea of creative and constructive uh, problem-solving skills that require you to be able to work in teams or groups or units, coordinating with people not only in front of you, but all around the world. And role-playing games encourage that. They encourage you to be able to look at a problem, look at the tools you have in front of you, look at the tools that the people around you have and come up with a creative solution. These skills are invaluable for young people because a few years uh, from now, things are going to be even further along and further developed than they are currently. And preparing young people for this for me is just one of these super important things. You know, role-playing games may be fun and of course they are fun, you know, yep. they practice these skills like a muscle um, and, you know, leave the kids like just w- well prepared for, for a lot of the stuff that they'll need um, in life after school. I, I couldn't agree more. And as somebody who does, uh, who's involved with hiring for one of the largest firms in the world, I can tell you that those are skill sets that are becoming harder and harder to find. And that's the ability to comfortably interact, not in a, any sort of staged ways, just to be able to sit and have a conversation. Believe it or not, that's getting harder and harder to find. Somebody who can just sit back and just talk to somebody. Two, problem solving is harder and harder to find. It's very easy to find people who can problem solve in their lane right? So I specialize at this. So you present me a problem in this lane and I can solve it. But what, what business really needs is somebody who can span across multi lanes because that's how the world works. Now we're not cogs anymore. We're we're you know, all integrated together. And the other thing that, um, I think you were hinting at too, is critical thinking and the ability to take in information, process it, and then piece it out again afterwards. And put it together. So I'm smoking what you're growing on that, man. That makes, I completely agree. And I think that gaming does present all of that. 
So guys, what we're going to do is take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to start picking Michael's brain. I want to learn more about Weirds Through the Breach. We'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. So everybody who listens knows, um, obviously, huge Malifaux fan. I've been playing Malifaux. That's what uh, gave birth to Third Floor Wars is Malifaux. But when COVID hit, um, I rediscovered my love of role playing, which I had been on a, about a 20 year hiatus from role playing um, and rediscovered it, um, you know, through this COVID stuff. And um, I got picked up a couple different role playing games that I was interested in through the breach was one of them. And um you know, obviously I'm familiar with the setting itself, um, but um, I would be interested how the setting from the tabletop translates to the role playing game itself. So my first question out of the gate is, um, do your games take place on which side of the breach do your games take place? Do they take place Earth side? Do they take place in Malifaux? Does it go back and forth or is there no set rule for that? Um, well, first of all, um, with most role-playing games, there is never a set rule. Like mechanics right. and mechanics, no matter where the setting is or what the game is, your version of Malfoy might be completely different. You can take these rules and run a space adventure. You know, that's that's the general generic rule of, of, of RPGs. You know, it's all about the GM and your story. For the Malfoy fans, um, a lot of what comes in through the breach leans in towards you playing a game set in Malfoy. Um, okay. And one thing I love about that is the fact that, well, you know, we know about Earth. We live there. We, you know, if you want to know uh, a little bit about, say, London in the 1900s, hit Google. You know, you don't need a yep. book to tell you what that is. So, um, so I guess the great thing about that is, yeah, you you you've got the stuff that Malifaux leans into for um, the Malifaux world, and the only places on Earth that you really get any attention to are the places of note, like you know, the train station at Santa Fe. Um, you know, London, obviously during, um, you know, the, uh, the Burning Man incident, uh, except, yep. and that's, that's more or less, um, what, uh, narratively what they look at. So I'd be curious, Michael, there's in my mind, there's two types of people that you bring in to play through the breach. That's people that have never played Malifaux and have never heard of Malifaux, the universe. And then people like me who have played the miniature game. So if let's start with the people listening that play actual, the Malifaux tabletop game, um, how do you bring them in and say, you really need to be trying this? All right. Well, the first thing I tell them is if you know how to play Malifaux second edition, you more or less already know everything complicated about the Mal uh, through the breach game. Everything that you used in second edition is more or less translatable. All the statistics, you know, your defense, your willpower, your movement speed, uh, how charge mechanics work, how burning and wow. and all those conditions. Everything it, you you you're you're almost playing a small skirmish when you are in combat situations in through the breach. So that's the interesting. That, that's the first thing. Secondly, is that if you love Malifaux, then I, I, I suspect that you also love the narrative from this setting. And the great thing about it is that everything that gets added to this game in terms of the stuff that you, you have and the stuff that you enjoy, it's all there. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a particular army that you, you play on the, on the field, not only will you be able to see those characters in the actual game itself, but you can even impose yourself into those scenarios and into those stories. Um, like, let's say you're a Ten Thunders fan and you uh, love the idea of the Torakage because you're you're running Misaki. I mean, um, uh, you know, sorry, uh, you know, you can easily become one of the Torakage. That's that's so cool. That's actually an option that you can actually do. Um, same thing if you um, you also want to play an undead character. There is an in expansion so that you can uh, look at being resurrected by, say, Seamus during one of his mass killing sprees. That is an option for you to play in this game. So those of you who know about um, what's happening in, in the world of Malifaux will find yourselves very easily at home in this role-playing game. 
So I'd be interested, how often in your sessions are you bringing in what we would consider named characters? Think people like Lucius and Sonia and stuff like that. So, okay. So this is where the mechanics sort of come in a little bit. Um, the ranking system of Through the Breach and Malifaux are the same. You have Masters, you have Henchmen, you have Enforcers. Um, given its second edition, you also have Peons down the very, very bottom. Masters are the strongest entities in Through the Breach. They are they are basically untouchable. You see one, you run, in a nutshell. Right. Um, there are a number of ways that you can use them in the game. Uh, I, for example, use them mostly for cameos or for what I like to call event encounters. Um, mm -hmm. A great example of an event encounter is um, my group was trying to sort of steal some stuff from a warehouse that the Arcanists were uh, basically also trying to steal stuff from. And Kairos was trying to distract the guild by setting a series of fires. Now, Kairos was there, big metal wings, fire raining down from the sky. And the group then needed to run from this expanding brush fire. Now, they didn't really interact with Kairos. Right. But they got to see that moment and they got to be a part of this big battle that was, that was happening. Um, and my players at the time actually didn't know this, but I actually based that encounter off a match that i played with the Kairos army uh and you know there were a couple of moments where it's like cool um i moved all my burning tower tokens to this one poor guy in the guild and then just set him ablaze so in the distance you could see these four pylons of fire slowly encroaching on the <laughs> and then you heard this person like going ah as you know oh that's place. so cool um, you know, and being able to, to, to translate that was, was, you know, for me, it was, was fun. Cause you know, again, that, they didn't know it because they weren't part of that match, obviously, but right. it was great inspiration for it. So, so they are a part of it, uh, to, to answer the question again, um, the masters and all that, and all the main characters, um, the more powerful they are, the less likely you are to come across them. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you'll definitely encounter them. But they're part of the world, right? So you might hear about them. You may not actually, you know, fight them necessarily, but 100%. but they're a part of that universe, which is which I think is neat. Now, I would imagine when you're when you are introducing the game and you have a player who's familiar with the tabletop game, understanding the world, and there's a lot you don't have to explain, right? Yeah. But take me now to a situation because you have several players on your channel that I'm sure know nothing about Malifaux until they go through the breach. How do you describe the the setting to them? Oh, um, so basically I have a spiel that I, that I go to, and it usually goes along the lines of Malifaux is set in a world of the early 1900s in a magic, in a magic punk type realm where uh, Earth itself has been shaped not by uh, steam and coal and fuel, but by the presence of magic. Back in the ancient times, magic was a visceral part of this universe. However, over time, it began to dwindle. And as it did, the mages began to panic. They wanted to try and grab and clasp back at this magic that they once had. And in their search for this power, tore a breach open to a new world, a nightmarish dimension running parallel to our own, which was filled with magic. And they managed to harness this through the power of a crystal known as soul stones. But man does what man does, and as they're incurred upon this realm filled with denizens of a rather uh, nightmarish nature, they um, they earned the ire of twelve or thirteen, I think, great tyrants that uh, that began to move using humans as pieces on a chessboard uh, as they slowly began to free themselves from their quiet slumber, and uh, over time, of course, this began to change the world. Uh, the breach, of course, um, and the soulstone trade gave birth to the Merchantile Guild, who run almost like an entire government system themselves. The whispers of a tyrant known as the Graveyard, uh, the graveyard Spirit rose to power mag magicians known as necromancers, capable of wielding powers of life and death. Um, other groups from other countries, such as, of course, the, uh, the Ten Thunders, uh, a group of um, of a mix matched hodgepodge yakuza like uh, criminal underground began to also try to get in on the soulstone trade. Um, as magic became more and more policed, of course, mages also tried to rise up, creating, of course, the arcanists who fight back for their rights and their liberties once more. 
And of course, there are those who simply wish to exist uh, in the world of Malifaux, trying to find a new life for themselves away from Earth. The outcasts, such as, of course, the free corpsmen, uh, bandits and desperados living on the hard lands, on the, the sweat of their brow, uh, also exist within this, uh, this, this quite incredible space. But, um, of course, as mentioned, um, Malifaux was not empty. It was not abandoned. And there were denizens and creatures that lurked within the shadows of this place. The Neverborn, creatures that appeared as demons, nightmares, and some even more horrifically appearing as humans, uh, also live and reside within Malifaux. And even more bizarre are the creatures known as gremlins, who, well, no one's quite sure where gremlins came from. Even the Neverborn have no quite no idea where they, they kind of showed up for. But uh, the more that they observed, the more that they learned uh, from their new co-conhabitors, um, the more they became a, a clear and present force within the realm of Malifaux. Um, this is the world that you find yourself in. This is the realm where anyone can do anything so long as the fates are on their side. But of course, it is a place where bad things happen. <laughs> that's cool now obviously that's the first time you've said all of that right that was not anything oh, yeah. you've done before <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. that was very cool that was very cool michael it, it, it does an amazing job of capturing all of it and uh, makes you want to play which is really what the, what your job is in that situation um it's funny you, like i'm hearing you say that and i'm, I'm reminded when i first came across malifo the tabletop game and uh there was two things about the tabletop game that turned me off right out of the gate and that was the card mechanic because I thought it was a gimmick. And then the second thing is I thought the setting was a gimmick too. I thought the setting was them seeing, let's get every miniature of every different style we can think of. And let's come up with a stupid excuse to put them all together in the same game. Well, fast forward, not very long. And I realized my two favorite things about Malifaux are how cool the setting is because it's badass as hell. And two, the card mechanic, which I think is brilliant. But what I have to, when I go back and think about it, the moment where I went, whoa, and what you saying that brought me back to it is I remember reading the rule book in the lore part of the miniatures game and that moment when the breach uh, right before the breach closes and the body gets thrown through the breach and has got hours it like engraved on its chest or on his forehead or anything like that. I'll never forget that moment. I was like, holy shit, this stuff is pretty cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I remember that as well. Like um, reading the reading through the lore and stuff like that, which is in the uh, in the um, sort of introduction section of the core rule book, uh, does actually go into that event and then what happened yeah. around that. And um, that was that was just an amazing moment. And you know, it, I I it's in the back of my head, but I feel like you actually know who wrote that and and what and and what they intended when they when they threw that across. Um, I, yeah, they hint that it's never born in, in, in the in the tabletop game. They hint that it's the never born. But I don't think and I and granted, I'm way behind in the lore. I don't know if we ever fully figure it out, but it's a moment. But go ahead. What you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like I said, I think it is because, I mean, there are like like so many books and, you know, like off the top of my head. Yeah. I'm like, I, I feel like I remember it being said like it was it was this because I know that there, there was mentioned that the, uh, the the reason the breach closed or the, the events around the bre- breach closing was December doing something. And it was right. like the blizzards that uh, that started rising up um and i think it was around the stuff that was reading there but yeah it was um it was it was one of these things like the closing of the breach and the starting of like you know the black powder wars and stuff like that um this was a moment a shifting moment because you could have easily run malifaux at that point you know before the breach closing and stuff like that but that closing of the breach created a sense of desperation in the world you know things got pushed into overdrive you know there was that things changed everywhere and when it reopened it's almost like everyone has taken this this breath like there's this hesitant step to find out what is going to be there when you take that first plunge and that for me is the perfect role-playing setting that's exactly oh, yeah. what you want you know you want to be taking those first steps on adventure you want to 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 forge the avant-garde of of, of this quest with your your own you know personal hand in things um and i love that i love the fact that it builds it so damn well that um no matter who you are you could play the most mundane character like you could play a baker and by the simple premise that you are a baker in malifaux something has happened in your life to have led you to that avant-garde place and you know 
even out, out at the outset, something is going to change. Something, fate is going to twist in a way that is going to shape your future. So I'd be curious, Michael, how how hard is that setting transitioning for experienced players from out that have never played? So you find somebody who, you know, a big D and D player or plays some, you know, plays, uh, you know, a, any of the other millions of role playing games out there, how foreign or how familiar is it for them to come in and play through the breach? Um, so first of all, um, most role playing games do rely on dice. So immediately the card mechanic is something that, um, that, you know, sort of a lot of people ask questions about, um, I honestly say this. A lot of people seem very hesitant to play things that they're not familiar with because, of course, with a lot of role-playing games, as we have known it over years, requires this level of learning curve, which, of course, can be difficult and can be tricky. And if you're playing a game that not everyone is familiar with, of course, you're going to want to go, ah, do I really want to spend 12 hours learning how to play this game if I'm only going to play it once? You know, these are natural questions. The great thing about this game is that it is so simple to learn. And because of its simplicity, um, all you really need to know are what skills are available for this for this particular game. And that's it. Yeah. You flip a card, you add a skill, you do the thing. It's so heavily reliant on you as a role player that, sure, there are tons of powers and abilities and things that you can you can use and you can access to, of course, enhance your gameplay. But at the end of the day, there is nothing stopping you from picking up your good old trusty pistol or a rifle and just being this, you know, kind of Wild West desperado um, in this setting or a mage or a, or a doctor. And that, I think, is one of the biggest breaches is that you don't need this massive learning curve. You can just dive into it. So how about the setting, though? I'd be curious to know, like, from people who have never played Malifaux, and then they go through a session or two with you in Malifaux, and this is their first introduction to that world, what are some of the things that they tell you about it? What, things that they like or things that they had, had trouble with? Um, okay, so yeah, the um, I suppose the biggest thing I find that people have had trouble with um, is there are gaps uh, in, in I guess, the narrative uh, a little bit. As there is obviously a penchant towards early 1900s and obviously um, the alternate Earth stuff, um, there is a lot of comparison to that. For example, you can play someone who is Italian. You know, that's perfectly fine. But what does that mean when you reach Malifaux? Right. Um, because uh, early 1900s uh, are still, even though it's kind of adjacent to where we are, is still drastically different. You know, there is technologies that we don't have available to us right now, such as the uh, the giant mechanics like the peacekeepers and the riot breakers and the guardians and stuff. We don't have that technology or the limb enhancers or, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with like the early 1900 uh, music. Mm -hmm. Right. But we have Crossroads 7 who are, you know, primarily, you know, 1950s to, you know, 1990s kind of rock band. So there, there are these moments and these kind of twists that um, I suppose – cause a st stutter or a stagger in, a, in, in that kind of suspension of disbelief. But beyond that, um, I have found that no player that I've ever shown this game to has struggled with mechanics or have struggled with coming up with brilliant character ideas and novel creative character concepts, uh, nor have they balked away when I've had the absolute pleasure of being able to introduce them not only to a uh, a master or a miniature from um, from the setting, but also to then pull out my miniature yeah. and then to show them and say, this is the guy, this is who you see in front of you. Um, you know, that, that tangibility is also like just absolutely wonderful. So you've had a lot of very experienced people in the role-playing world on your channel before as players, um, people that have channels in their own right and are, are you know, uh, names within the group. I would be interested what their feedback was on the setting, because like I said, my first impression of the setting when I came across it, is I thought it was gimmicky and silly until I realized how good it was. I'd be interested what other people that are familiar with many different role-playing settings thought about the Malifaux setting when you introduced it to them. Um. So, okay, so going over a couple of the uh, the people that I was running recently. Um, so for those of you who, um, you know, are in the role-playing circuit, um, World Anvil is a uh, absolutely fantastic world-building um, website where you can actually go to to 
place and, and create your your worlds and, and stuff like that. And Janet is one of the uh, the co-founders of this particular company, co-CEO. Um, she was playing on my Through the Breach game. And this is one a person who I greatly respect because she literally, like, she writes novels. She knows so much about world building. Yeah. Her and her family are... Uh, are amazingly intuitive when it comes to not only world history, but like, you know, literally, um, you know, history in general. Um, she was in love with the setting. Wow. She, she loved the fact that she could use so much of that real world history, ranging from the little details, like the, the outfit that she was using and reference like opera singers from that particular era, actually know what style of music uh, there was in, you know, um, because there was that close tie, but still so drastically different, she she absolutely fell in love with it. She felt like she could connect to it so easily. Um, Guy from How to Be a Great Game Master, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, role player, um, gives tons of great advice on his YouTube channel and his Twitch channel. Um, he played a lawyer, which uh, in the world of Malifaux is not simply somebody who puts on a funny wig and, uh, and yells at a, a judge but someone who actually has almost the power over the universe itself to kind of shift things, uh, to kind of fit into the law when they really want to. Um, he, I think, started off by p wanting to play this very abrasive character. And when he got into the world and actually saw like how much influence that almost non-magical but supernatural aspect to the game uh, the, the narrative brought yeah. in, he fell in love with it as well. Um, like he, he played a character called, uh, sorry, a, a type of character called a forgotten. So people would just forget about him. He was a very forgettable person. Um, and he embraced it as a role player. He loved that. The fact that the people in, in, in Malifaux just couldn't remember where he was <laughs> or who he was, or, you know, what his name was. Even the people who he as a lawyer were, were representing couldn't remember his name or the conversations they had. Um, and then when, when things went drastically wrong and reality itself, you know, was collapsing around him being a lawyer and then being able to object to that, uh, and then like have elements of the world change around him. The great thing is, is from a setting perspective, you can't really do that in Dungeons and Dragons yeah. or, or, or any of these other settings without being like this all powerful godlike wizard of some kind, but being able to kind of, you know do that with 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 your with a generic character and stuff um even in like tiny little pockets was was very appealing oh that's that's cool yeah yeah no it was it, it was definitely a, a, a one, one of the better better moments for that what i think is neat about that too uh michael is that those two people that you just talked about are incredible good incredibly good judges um because of again their breadth of knowledge and their experience Absolutely. Absolutely. The, between the two of them, I think, um, well, actually between the three of us, technically, uh, I would, I would definitely say that, um, guy has had just so much experience as a, as a storyteller, as a narrator, as someone who has just been just so talented at building, uh, a great tale. And Janet, of course, as I said, uh, a world builder in her, in, in her right, uh, and a great, um, creator of a, a massive and uh, very intricate lore. Uh, and of course myself being very, acting, yep. charismatic, character-driven uh, individual, the three of us looking at this game, and when all of us turn around and say, hey, this is a great game, you know, um, it covers just so many different aspects that just hit all the marks. That's really cool. So, guys, we're going to take another break. During this break, you're going to go get your Gen Con buy list, add the Through to Breach uh, core book to it, so that uh, you can hit that $100 mark to get your free mini. But when we do get back from this break, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about Through the Breach. So we're going to get a little bit deeper. And if you aren't already sold on this RPG, you will, buy, will be by the end of the next segment. We'll be right back. Howdy friends, Greg here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom-made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 three three full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. 
Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com. That's with one M. Or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend all one word t-h-i-r-d-f-l-o-o-r-f-r-i-e-n-d you'll get a five percent discount and help support the podcast it's valid on everything except retail products and play mats so the one thing that i think is interesting um for me uh with michael is uh through the breach is not the only role playing game he's experienced with. He has played a lot of role playing games and he, um, I don't want to say specializes in through the breach, but if you go through his channel, you're going to see more through the breach than you're going to see anything else. And in my opinion, he is the premier, uh, promoter on YouTube for, for the game itself. And it's not like he played a bunch of stuff, then played through the breach and stopped. You are Michael constantly going out and playing other different games. So, from the gate, I'd be really interested to know what what's the gravity around through the breach for you. What what keeps you there? What makes you want to get other people playing it? What makes you go out and play other games and then come back to it? So uh, I guess I've got to um, I've got to actually uh, answer that in in two parts. The first thing is the gravity towards not only through the breach but just Malifaux in general. Yeah, because for me that's one of the heavy things that draws me in is that I love Malifaux as well as through the breach. Um, the way I got into that was um, was originally uh, way back when I um, I ended up uh, being asked by my boss at uh, at my at, at the youth center to run some tabletop games. Now at the time I'd never touched a tabletop war game in my life. Oh like, wow! They um, yeah I was already maybe three years into my into role playing, running Pathfinder, running Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, it was around the time of Age of Sigmar and um, Games Workshop actually approached my boss and said, hey, we heard that you're, you're doing geek stuff, you know, cool. Age of Sigmar's coming out. We, we'd love to help you start your own club. Here's some stuff. Here's some things. And I was like, cool, fantastic. And they said, Michael, we want you to learn how to do this. And I'm like, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. Like, I, I can tell you about Dark Heresy. I can tell you about this role playing game. I can tell you about the lore and all that. But building minis, playing that kind of thing, no clue. And they said, yeah. Yeah, but you can learn. And I'm like, you are aware the skills aren't translatable, right? Like, it, me learning would be like you learning. And it's like, yeah, but you're the nerd. You can <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's where I actually picked it up. And and I mean, no, no offense to to Warhammer. It is an awesome game. Uh, I definitely you know enjoy Kill Team a lot. Um, but my kids hated it. They yeah. absolutely despised Age of Sigma. They did, and and now I had all this terrain and all these pieces, and I had my boss looking at me like I'd stuffed up, and I had to find something to do. I had to find some way to use all of the stuff that we'd bought. So um, I I went out to uh, my local convention and I started exploring games, and that's when I saw Malifaux. I saw everything. I saw the minis. I saw uh, how passionate the people were. I saw how 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 much they wanted to talk, not just about the the world, but all of the mo- the models, like every single model, had a story, had a had a whole lore about it, and that's what hooked me. Because as a role player, that's what I look for. I look for some great story, and when you can look at a, a, a like a, a an army and say all of this squad belongs to one thing, that's great. If you look at a squad and then go, each of these people are someone yeah. with a, with a history, with a knowledge, with a background, that for me is what'll draw me, and that's what drew me two through the breach is that to play a role-playing game in this world where everyone is so visceral and so vivid was 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 what what drew me there what kept me there was the simple fact that it is not like any other game that i'm currently playing it is a game that is set in an entirely different fantasy world it is a game that is set in even a different era so even stylistically building characters is completely different to any of the other games I'm playing. And for me, I love variety. I love being able to sort of, you know, flex my muscles with different types of characters because, you know, you play a a kobold bard in Dungeons and Dragons who specializes in punk rock. You kind of are playing a bit of a silly game. You know, you're not really getting into the lore. You're just kind of, you know, having a bit of fun, which nothing wrong with that. You can always have a bit of fun, but you can play 
something like that in Through the Breach. And it wouldn't it wouldn't be out of place. You would be yep. a part of the world. And that inclusivity, I guess, is what keeps me in Through the Breach, is that whenever I'm playing it, I feel like I'm part of the world. And I feel like I don't need to, I almost feel like in a way I don't need to pretend to be something mm-hmm. um, big and grand and loud in order to be big and grand and loud in this world. Because there are just regular people who are like that. I mean, best best example of that is Captain Dashiell. Captain Dashiell, it, you know, I mean, started first edition as just some guy and then he became a henchman and now he's a master. You know, you see the the growth of Captain Dashiell in almost the same way you could see any character in Through the Breach grow. And that for me is is what keeps me there. That idea, that 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 hope that no matter what I play, I'll always feel a part of this setting. I love that. One of the things you talked about, which I love about the tabletop miniature game is that, you know, each model is something it's each model is its own character and its own story. I love hearing that that translates to through the breach, that that feeling that you can play just a common lawyer, but you're not just a lawyer or a baker who has a yeah. bake shop in Malifaux is not just a baker who has a bake shop in Malifaux. I think that's really, really cool how that translates through. Um, so question for you, Michael, because there's people listening right now that either have through the breach and have really wanted to get people playing it, or there's people that are now listening to this and are going, Oh crap, I'm going to buy this game. Um, what are some tips or things that we can tell people to kind of get the ball rolling? Um, so maybe they've got already have people that have friends that play D and D or people have never role played before. Um, can you offer them some, some uh, shallow ramps to get them, get them started? Oh yeah, absolutely. So basically if you go to your local pharmacist, uh, they will not carry chloroform. Okay. You need to go to a specialist <laughs> store, right? But the formula is on your website. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, no, the, um, look through the breach is a great game. It sells itself more or less once you open the pages, once you look in the book and actually give that, that first leap into it. Um, everything about it just screams simple, elegant, and more importantly, it does not stress over things like hard, fast mechanics um, or power curves or levels and stuff like that. In fact, it almost encourages the Fate Master to be a little silly with the power levels. One of the uh, major mechanics of this, this game, which I, I promote every time, is when you build a character for Through the Breach, you create what's called a destiny. It is a series of phrases that associate with the random generation of your character. And it's almost like this very elegant, very melancholy poem. Hmm. When you achieve a a line in that poem, you then unlock a great and tremendous power. So uh, let me, let me give you an example here. Like um, I've I've, I've got the book up here and uh, one of the things, let's say that you are, you are generating a character. Um, Pick a, pick a, pick a random card. You know, we'll just, we'll just go with this. Pick a random card for uh, Uh, four tomes. Four times. Okay. So having a look at the basic core rule book and looking under the stations, which of course define the background of your character and where you come from. A four of tomes is an accountant. So that means your parents were an accountant or you grew up in a family, like maybe you were adopted by a family of an accountant, uh, of an accounting firm. Um, As such, you have mathematics as your specialty skill. So you automatically gain a rank in, in mathematics and your phrase, or at least the first destiny phrase is, and the torch will splutter into darkness. Okay. <laughs> now that is now that's really creepy. And what could happen in this case is maybe you're you're on, on an adventure, um, looking into a rat problem below the sewers of Malifaux, and um, as you're sort of traipsing through with the with a torch in hand, um, you know, as you come closer to this kind of foul smelling stagnant area, you realize that there's methane in the air, so you decide to stifle your your torch and you need to proceed in darkness. So as you do that scene you notice that your eyes suddenly start to take on a more verminous oh, uh, appearance. And, you, uh, and, and what would happen with that destiny step is you can now see in darkness without a torch. Um, and your eyes kind of have like almost the semblances of a rat. Now, this is how this works. It's, 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 a, it's just an ability. Just have it. There it is. There, what's the mechanics? What's the distance? What's the range? No, no, no. None of that stuff. None of that stuff. You can see in the dark, flat out. That's cool. And the Fate Master is the one that's going to help kind of bridge that and make that all come together? Yep. So the Fate Master makes it up. And oh, that's I, great. I of, and I know, that the, I know that a lot of Fate Masters out there are like, oh, but how do I balance that? Don't balance it. Flat out. 
That's the great thing about this is you do not need to. It is supposed to be something powerful. It is supposed to be something amazing. Um, and that's that's kind of the nature of this game is it's not trying to nerf people. It's not trying to keep people balanced or, or keep people down. It's about trying to make some amazing characters who eventually rise to almost a, an equal power to the masters of Malifaux itself. Um, so that is probably the first thing I'd say. If you are a GM trying to plug this, Remember, like, just tell them outrightly, like, hey, guys, listen, you can become incredibly powerful. There is no kind of power scaling or power curve. Everyone is just powerful as they go through. And it is all about the role play and your interactions. So obviously, if someone wants to get into this and they don't have the core rule book, that's the first given, right? We got to get that. Would I be interested, though, because, you know, kind of the first jumping point for a role playing game is obviously I need the rules. Right. But I also need to kind of I need to kind of figure out where to start. And a lot of times what I have found helpful is a beginner first adventure or first hook or something. Is there something in the core book that you like and recommend as a good initial adventure for people to run through? Or is there somewhere something else where people can go? Uh, well, actually, yes. In fact, uh, at the in the back of the, the core rule book uh, on page 408. Uh, there is a small adventure called Bad Things Happen. That was actually the first adventure I ran. Um, I believe it is on my YouTube channel. If you wish to watch it, I do apologize. Oh. The audio, the audio was a bit crap. It was actually my very, very first, um, first run of trying to figure out how to put through the breach in a online space. So there were lots of technical bugs, but you know, we ran through that adventure. It was a lot of fun. Um, that was probably the first one for me, but. If I were to say that if you were to have a look at like, you know, um, getting into an adventure and stuff, the first one I would recommend is, let me see if I get this right. Okay. I believe it is called the Northern Aggression. Okay. Now the reason, the reason I recommend the Northern Aggression is one, it is a, um, it is a mid ranged, um, format adventure. And it is. It takes place again up north, um, as the you know sort of uh, the riots and things are happening with the MNSU and with the guild. You get a nice little showcase of, of some of the stuff that's happening, um, you know, around the world of Malifaux and some of the conflicts you're dealing with. Uh, importantly, as well, is that there are, uh, or at least there is a second part to that adventure, and plans for a third. Nice. So the Northern tradition is, is an optional thing. So I love it when, when adventures sort of, you get to that point where it's like, oh, okay, cool. I want to play a game, but I don't want to commit to like the full kind of adventure. This is a prime example of that. You can play the Northern aggression. And then if you feel like continuing after you've played that, there is actually a continuation. So you'll be able to, to stretch that out. But um, while I'm on this kind of point, um, I'm actually going to say this outrightly. Another very positive element to Through the Breach is it lends itself incredibly well to one-shot adventures. Oh, okay. At the end of every single session, your character effectively levels up, or in, or as we call it, um, gains a rank in the pursuit that they're following, which is the, what they use in place of classes. Every single game. What this means is that you can play... A single one-shot adventure, say play for four, four to six hours, you, you have a good game, and you get to the end of it, your character levels up. You then put that character on the shelf, leave it there, and then when you play your next one-shot um, somewhere else with a thing, you can grab the character off the shelf, pick a pursuit, and play that game with this character again. Nice. You don't need to commit yourself to an entire campaign, get from level one to 20, and then you know retire your character. You can play uh, from a stable of characters back and forth um, based on when you'd need them. The, um, the real only restriction in terms of that is that once you've completed all of your destinies, the character basically retires at that point. Oh, no kidding. Oh, so that's that, interesting. That's interesting. So you're both encouraged to complete your destinies, but you'll see that a lot of characters will end up on their fourth destiny step and then they'll, um, you'll kind of put them on the shelf <laughs> or, you'll, or you'll kind of, you know, oh man, I thought I had this destiny, but I didn't. <laughs> What a shame. Because you don't want them to go away. You don't want to put them on the yeah. shelf. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, I, do, I do have a couple of my players um, in my home games who actually have a couple of, like, insta-kill characters. Like, no matter what they do, the next thing they're going to do, they'll probably complete their destiny step. So they leave it there until I say, okay, cool, guys. We're going to be heading uh, into the bayou, and we're going to be heading to the Kythera. Uh, it's surrounded by Titania's army and stuff like that. They'll then reach up to that shelf. They'll pull out, <laughs> pull out the- 
pull out the guy with like 12 ranks in, in, in a pursuit and then be like, yeah, okay, cool. I guess this is the time that he needs to go. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no. Very, very cool. So guys, we're going to take another break. When I get back from this break, I want to take a little bit of a step back instead of talking about specifically through the breach, because I realize for a lot of listeners, maybe you have never played role playing games, or if you were like me, you took a long break from role playing games. And I really want to learn from Michael um, what it takes um, in his mind to not only get the most out of role playing games as a player, but also as a GM. So we'll be right back. Howdy friends, here on the third floor you'll find us playing Malifaux and other games on Mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, and lighter than neoprene. These mats use a new material that almost eliminates any glare. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. Pick a mat size, pick a design, then choose an overlay like the one for Marvel Crisis Protocol or Malifaux 3rd Edition strats and schemes. It's going to speed up your deployment and the placement of strategy and objective markers. Until the end of June 2020, you can use the new promo code THIRDFLOOR620 to get a 10% discount on your next order. In the notes, you can ask for the Third Floor Wars logo to be put on your mat for free. Again, use the promo code THIRDFLOOR620, that's T-H-I-R-D-F-L-O-O-R 620, to get a 10% discount. All the details are in the show notes. I know for a lot of you, you you either were like me, which is you played D and D back in you know high school, college, um, and then took a break because of real life. Or I know there's a lot of people because I've got players in my games right now that have never played role playing games before, and you know now it's kind of nice because people at least know what the hell it is. Uh, 15 years ago, you had to explain the whole thing to them. But now because of the exposure uh, from Stranger Things, Critical Role and things like that, people at least understand what role playing games are. Um, But um, for somebody who has is listening right now, who has never either played or run a game or never, never done an RPG. What do you think are some of the key things for them to know and understand? Um, because they need to be playing, you know, that, and I know that because we're both big fans of role playing. What are some key things that they need to understand? Good question. Um, with new players, like people who have no experience in role playing game, um, games whatsoever. I think one thing important to understand is that, the people who make up the role-playing game community are very close to one another. And that is something expansive to all games, not just Through the Breach. If you find someone who wants to run you through a game of Through the Breach and you've never played it before and you've never role-played before, just um, just remember that you know what you might see as nervous is something that everyone goes through. Everyone kind of gets to that point where it's like, you know, um, I, I don't know how to role-play. And so that's okay. There's no right or wrong way to role-play. Um, oh, but I don't do voices because, you know, I've watched, um, you know, people, professional GMs and stuff play. Um, I'm not going to run a game because I'm worried that expectations will be so high. Don't be worried about it. You know, um, there are always going to be people, even in a professional forum, who will make mistakes, who will decide that today I'm just way too tired and I'm just going to talk in my normal voice rather than a funny voice. You know, you do not need to set the bars or the standards high when it comes to role playing in general. Through the Breach is just absolutely fantastic because it is just very, very comforting. It is a very uh, easy game to not only pick up, but also a very, very uh, comfortable game to be a, a fun, quirky, silly character or even just a, a quiet character. Like, it, you know, playing a wallflower is very doable. In fact, like, I, as I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, there is literally a character pursuit called the Forgotten, someone who specializes in not being noticed. So if you're brand new to role-playing and you've never done it before, this is a great game to start with. Um, just because there's just so much there that you'll be able to not only relate to and connect to due to just the fact that it's an alternate Earth, but also with the group of people who all pretty much have been exactly where you'd be standing, you know, brand new yep. players, new GMs. Um, and, you know, right now through the breach doesn't have uh, that many uh, fate masters floating around there. So chances are, if you get into this game, you will find a fate master who will be sitting there asking the same questions about the system that you will. And, you know, together you guys can learn 
um, exactly how awesome this game truly is. And sometimes that can be the best experience when everybody's new and everybody's kind of figuring it out all together. Um, so if some, let's say now that we fast forward a little bit and somebody listening has found a game and they're going to play on Friday, um, what are some, maybe some tips you can give them as far as character creation, um, things that they should think about and not worry about as far as what's going to happen Friday night? Um, okay, so let's go with, um, let's start with character creation, because that's obviously going to be an important one. Character creation does involve a level of RNG. You, uh, in order to create a character, you would flip a tarot, and this tarot would define everything from your, you know, where your background was, uh, to your physical stats, your mental stats, what skills your character is proficient in. You might have in your mind that you're going to be one of the most intelligent uh, characters of engineering possible, but then you flip something that is hot garbage, which is negative one, negative one, negative one, zero. And you sit there and go, ah, oh, don't be afraid of low numbers because uh, there are actually feats and abilities that require you to have low numbers in order oh. to use them. So, um, so yeah, like for example, there is uh, one called street smarts. You have to have an intelligence of negative one or lower because that's the nature of it. It's like, you're not academic, you're street smart. Right. And then it gives you bonuses to that. So, so negatives aren't a bad thing in this game. And, and that's, you know, important to remember. If, um, if you're building a character, always remember that, um, it's never a bad idea to lean on your knowledge from Malifaux. Uh, if you don't have any knowledge from Malifaux, um, you know, find someone who does, you know, yeah. like, um, turn around and say hey look I, i'm making a character for this through the breach game the gm said that we're apparently going to go and uh and go to the northern wastes and go hunt down a wendigo um what should i be prepared for it's like well it's cold uh so you know uh have someone who uh you know specializes in traveling in the cold or maybe a mage who specializes in summoning fire game and that'd be useful yeah um little things like that um the more knowledge that you can you can accrue always makes uh, a, a massive difference there. So how about somebody transitioning, Michael? So somebody transitioning from D&D &D or one of the Fantasy Flight role-playing games, um, what are some key things for them to keep in mind as they as they move to move to the breach? Okay. Um, well, what baggage? What baggage do they need to leave at the station? Uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to quote one of my favorite uh, film, villains from the the Marvel universe here. Don't get too attached, men. Uh, right. Like, like seriously, there's, there, there are so many people who, when they look at a new system, will try and drag in a bunch of house rules and stuff like that. The thing is, is through the breach is very, very, very simple. Um, very similar to the D and D mechanic of advantage and disadvantage through the breach has something very similar flipping at advantage and disadvantage as well. Um, don't stress out about adding incremental numbers or trying to factor in a whole bunch of different things. Relax. Just, is this hard? Is this not hard? If it's not hard, you know, or even if it's negligibly hard, just give it to people. Just say, yeah, yeah I want to, I want to, I want to climb up a ladder and get onto the roof really quickly. Sure. No worries. Just do it. You know, you don't need to flip a roll for it. Um, you know, if it's like, cool, you want to do it, but it's raining. All right, sweet. Let's, let's make a flip. Uh, and maybe a disadvantage because it's wet and slippery and there is a actual consequence. That's the only real, real, real advice I have for, for people who are coming from those, those background places. Don't, uh, don't look for rules. Um, you know, the game is not, well, I mean, the game is obviously designed to have rules, but it's not designed right. for, for like kind of the, the hyper hyper physics. Yeah. So, um, so don't worry about those just, um, you know, play and feel the vibe and, uh, within a short period of time, you'll pick up exactly how easy, um, ruling or GMing in this um, in this particular world happens to be. Well, it sounds to me like it's a very narrative focused RPG as opposed to a crunchy one. Is that an accurate statement? Oh yeah, absolutely, hundred yeah. uh, percent. Speaking of focus, by the way, that would be the other bit of advice: is don't forget your character can always just <laughs> concentrate and gain a focus point. That's like the amount of times I've had players turn around and go, "I need to make an athletics check or I'll die," and it's like, "Okay, what do you do?" I'm just going to make it. It's like, are you sure? You've got two actions. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Uh, <laughs> you sure you don't want to concentrate and have a think on that? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I concentrate. And I'll get a focus. I'll get a positive flip on my thing. It's like, good, excellent. <laughs> that's a good advice for the tabletop players, too. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget, you can concentrate. That's great. That, like that, that, I, I love the fact that it still translates. Yeah. You know? So here's a question for you. You've got, um, let's say that we've got somebody who has, has, DM'd 
or GMs, some of the crunchier systems out there, whether it be, you know, deep into GURPS or Savage Worlds or our D&D 5th edition or whatever, that, that's very crunchy. And that's not a bad thing. And they're transitioning maybe to running through the breach or something that's a far more narrative um, and has a different feel to it. Is there anything that you can offer them as advice as far as making that transition? Um, as the GM? Advice- yeah. So as a GM, uh, pretty much the only advice I would have for someone who's coming from a crunchier system is don't worry about the mechanical nature of what you know. Focus on what narratively would happen within those mechanics. If your character gets buried alive, sure, you could play Pathfinder and know all of the different checks and all the different roles and all the different things you need to bust out of the coffin, to dig through the ground, to like dig through the loamy soil and pull yourself out. You know, there's, there's all those checks and stuff like that. Pull the checks out of that. What is happening in the narrative? Your character's in a pine box. You know, you feel the hard wood. You try to break through, make an athletics check. Fantastic. Nice, quick, simple. You feel the soil there. You, you know, create that sense of world environment and they dig around. Instead of looking at it from check to check to check to check, look at it from narrative to narrative to narrative to narrative. Um, in fact, that is actually one of the major um, elements to the game is the combat side, which is called dramatic time. And within the narrative time, there is something called an ongoing challenge which functions like you basically say, cool, here are the skills that you can use to overcome this challenge. Here is your target number that you need to reach. And you are open with it. You say, this is what you need to get. And then they need to simply flip that and try to get that within those skills. If they succeed a number of times before they fail a number of times, they win. If they, however, fail, they, you know, again, might end up remaining buried or the like. That's cool. That's cool. There is, of course, uh, your hand as well. So your oh. hand actually does exist in this role-playing game as well. So if you do fail a, a skill check, um, much like in the Malifaux game, you actually do have a small deck of cards for yourself, which is called your uh, twist deck. You then draw your hand from there, and then you have the narrative, narrative deck, deck, which is the fate deck. And as the cards get flipped from that, you can then replace the card with the card from your hand to boost up a better thing. Cheat or to- fate. Yeah, to cheat fate or to uh, to get a uh, particular suit as well, because there nice. are also there are also triggers as well as in the uh, as in the uh, tabletop game as well. So here's a question for you, Michael. Um, obviously, you went through a large transition from never playing role playing games, being a GM for the first time, getting better, getting better, and now people pay you. They pay they uh, pay you to play. They pay you to do GM. I would like to know, um, and, and we don't, obviously we could do a series of podcasts on this and I don't want to, um, but I would <laughs> like to know what were some of the key breakthroughs for you as a GM where you feel like you leveled up as a GM? Was there anything that you kind of figured that you figured out or unlocked that, that really took you in your mind to the next level? Uh, yes. Oh my God. There were like three moments where I knew as a human being, I, I heard a, I literally heard a ding sound as as i did these things um the first happened uh, a long 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 time ago and that was when i um i underwent a guinness world record attempt um it was for the world's longest tabletop role-playing game and we played for 86 hours oh my goodness we played for 86 hours um that was a whole experience i um, bet I, I lost my voice for part of it and actually had to get an, a, an anesthetic for my throat so I could keep playing. Um, a, a lozenge, not a needle, just, just to be clear. <laughs> I, um, you know, we, when we got to the end point, I sounded like I was trying to do my best impression of like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. And, um, and after the 86 hours, I, like I said, I, I almost heard that visible ding that, that, you know, there is something I have done that, that, almost no one will do in their lifetime um the second moment well before we move away from that michael don't forget it but but i want to stay with there what happened like so you did the 86 hour stretch right that's i mean that's just that's that's survival as much as anything but what i would be more interested in finding out is after you heard that ding what changed in the in the sessions you ran after that so what do you think you learned or gained that 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 showed up soon afterwards 
by doing the 86 hours? Table management. Interesting. The thing is, uh, a lot of people talk about time management. Like, we've got a four-hour game. How can we fit what we have into that four hours? Flipping that script around and saying, I have 86 hours. <laughs> was an entirely different moment where instead of looking at how much I needed to squeeze in, I needed to look at how much I needed to draw out. Yeah. And as a GM, it taught me how to draw out my players way more. And I learned how to set more, uh, set better scenes to create a more tangible, vibrant world. And then once the stage was set to simply have my players cascade in it, um, and be able to interact, touch not only the stuff there, but the you know the, their fellow characters being able to engage with them, um, and then how I would just simply add tiny bits of fuel to the to the narrative or to the role play to keep that engine going. That I don't think I would have ever learned that had I not played a game that long, because yeah. that's not that's not in the in the idea. That's not the script. Is we want to do as much as we can in the four hours. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Whereas if you've got patience, if you've got time, if you got nothing but time it was yeah it was that, that was what awoken i guess very cool so I, I interrupted you what was the second second level up no that's okay i just i just hate talking about the guinness world record thing because I, I do have a, i do have a little announcement on that um basically we ended up uh going into a limbo because the paperwork wasn't done right oh no so, so yeah the, the we have the unofficial um guinness world record world longest board game but we have the footage. It's like 160 gigabytes of 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 me slowly going mad, but, but no. <laughs> um, the second moment was um, obviously a lot of the work I do is with young kids, and this one moment tested me in a way that I will never forget. And that is one of my kids I discovered um, had purchased, not even purchased, pirated the uh, the adventure module I was running for the kids wow. had read through it and was cheating to find all the secret entrances to avoid all the encounters. And I caught them out because of course they said, Oh, don't go in there. There's a beholder in there or there's a, there's a something in there. And as soon as he said that the whole, like, I mean, the, the atmosphere dropped in the room and I was, I was enraged I and bet. I never really, I'd, I'd, I'd never really say that I would, I would felt that way. I actually walked out. I said, I need, I need a minute. I walked out of the room. I went to my boss and I said, "Hey, listen, um, what what are the logistics of me kicking a kid out of my session?" And I said this, and then my boss, who knows me very very well, um, she is an absolute gem, um, and I know that she manipulates me. I know that she does this. She got me to play D and D on the beach once because she knows that I'm all ego. And she was like, oh, I bet, you know, you know, I don't think anyone, just anyone could run a game on the beach, though. You know, but I understand, <laughs> I understand why you couldn't. And next thing I know, I'm on the fucking beach with a, with, you know, like a freaking hat and shit. Um, <laughs> but um, this kid, I basically I, I basically told her about it. And she said, well, Michael, have you done everything you can? Is this all you have? Because if it is, then, yes, you can, of course, have this person removed. And I sat there and the, the ego side of me was battling against yeah. that rape. And of course, as most people know, the ego won. And I said, no, of course I can do better. I'm just really pissed off. Yep. So I walked back in. I told the kid to sit down. He thought he was gone. He was already pa- He already packed up his bag. He thought he was out. And he said, no, sit down. We're going to keep playing. And I created, I, I pretty much at that point in, I, I just flipped the script. We were no longer playing the module as it was written I, I changed it. It was it was almost all homebrew from that point on. Right. And I created a new NPC character, one that I still use to this day in lieu of punishing my players. And his name is Jack. And Jack is an NPC. He's even in the Through the Breach games as well. If someone's, you know, vexed me in an incredibly way, you have three warnings. The first is a playing card that appears on your person. In, in this case, it, it would be a, um, a, a an Ace of Crow, right? That would just appear on your person. The next thing is a puppet that appears. It's like a marionette almost just sitting somewhere idle. And you see it every now and then. The third is a human embodiment of that puppet who um, who then appears and doesn't curse the character. He curses the player. Mm. So the player then adopts this curse. And uh, no matter what character they play on whatever game, whatever table, until they have repented or or in some way shape or form 
reconciled over whatever they've done, they have that curse on all their characters. And, you know, it actually promoted them to actually start playing a lot better. And, and you know, he ended up leaving the game, you know, eventually. But in the interim, he actually became more pleasant and actually much more easier to, uh, to play with with everyone. Um, so it challenged me in a way that let me realize that I can always do better. I can always be patient and I can always push myself to um, uh, to just do what I need to in order to make the game work, even especially in a live forum as well, because yeah. things live, you know, I, I can't just have a tantrum and walk out when the camera's on. So that, that's a tough situation, Michael, because you've got several things happening there. One, it's a kid, right? So you got to take yeah. that into a factor, right? It, it, if it was a, some 38 year old guy, it's a completely different conversation. It's like, you're, you're a dick, right? Oh, but yeah, you're no. not going to have that conversation with a kid Two, because it, he's around or he or she is around peers. That makes things more difficult too, especially for a kid. Um, three, you're the adult in the room, which means you've got to act like the adult in the room, even if you don't feel like the adult in the room, right? What I would be interested is, and it may not have happened, but did you have any type of teaching moments afterwards with this kid? Was there any conversation afterwards about saying, look, I know what you did, but, um, or did, did he just figure it out through the game? He figured it out through the game. Flat gotcha. Out. Like, um, like pretty much when it happened, like I said, when I walked in and he already had packed his bags and stuff, I knew he knew he'd, he'd done goofed. And he knew that I, what, like, no point, and I mean, like, in, in, in my, I think I was, I was working there for like two years at that point. At no point in two years have I ever had to tell the kids, sorry, guys, I need to step out for a bit. Because yeah. I didn't send him out. I And that's what, you know, a lot of schools and That was a do. good move on your part. Yeah. I, like, I need to step out because, you know, I wouldn't let the kids, especially if I'm here to have fun with everyone, I wouldn't want them to see me yep. dealing with that. Um, and, yeah, I'm not a violent person. I'm not an aggressive person. That's at least good because you work with kids. <laughs> right. But, um, but I am a very, like, and you'll find this, actually, you'll find this about a lot of Australians. Australians are very sarcastic people. And we can be very emotionally crippling if you're not prepared for us, yeah. you know? Um, so I know that I could have said something that was inappropriate. I know mm -hmm. I could have said something that would, would, would have really hurt this person and made it so that they wouldn't have enjoyed role-playing anymore. And that's not what I'm about. Yep. Um, I'm very glad that I dealt with it that way. Like, you know, current Michael is very good, glad that past Michael was patient. And no matter what happens now, Anytime something happens, like someone's playing a min-max character or every time someone interrupts my monologue to try and shoot my NPC in the face, everything now just washes off my back because yeah. I remember this one kid and how I handled that. Um, I feel almost impervious to bullshit. Yeah, you know. and you have to you have to get that way a little bit as a GM, especially as you, especially when you're in a situation where you haven't built the trust as a group yet, and you're still kind of figuring out what that trust looks like. All right, so let me hear the third one. What was the third level up? All right, so the third level up, the third level up was probably my uh, my favorite level up. Um, so one of the things I did again very recently, very very recently, was I played uh, a one man epic. Uh, the one man epic is one GM, twenty five players. Whoa. So uh, I did that, and that would actually broke my own record. Um, I previously did 21. Um, that was a nightmare. Um, and I, I swore that I'd never do it again. Um, long story short, not blaming my bosses, but I'm blaming my bosses. Um, they were supposed to cap my, my session because I didn't have my assistant GM. I actually have an assistant um, who, who runs the same game at the same time. We collaborate. We you know kind of line up all our stuff, and then we kind of keep everyone kind of on par. Um, he was unavailable during these, the last holidays. And so I, um, I ran this game and I, you know, 10 kids came in, another five came in, another five came in, another five came in. And I what was, was I the was age like, ranges. Um, youngest kid was 10. Wow. Oldest kid was, I want to say 19. No kidding. Which, um, you know, yeah, at that point, that's a young person. That's not, that's not, well, a kid. that's a huge difference. A huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, pretty much at that point, looking at the scenario, I was like, okay, cool. I need to look at entertaining all these kids for the next six hours. It was a six hour game. Um, and for me, the level up moment came from realizing that I had like being able to look at each of these individuals 
and say, I need to entertain these people while I'm dealing with another table because every second I'm not on your table, you're disconnecting and you're losing yeah. interest. So what I started doing was I started leaving on cliffhangers and leaving questions as I went to each table. I even then got to a point where I was getting them to design encounters. Oh, so that's I, so cool. So I basically said, okay, cool. You guys are on, on six different caravans heading out into the, into the wilderlands. You're delivering supplies to soldiers in the middle of the badlands, right? Um, so you guys are going to go, you know, visit, um, the, the guild guys over here. You guys are going to visit the, um, the, you know, some arcanists over here. You know, they're all doing different things. And I said, cool. I want you to build a monster, just create a monster, any kind of monster whatsoever. And then I went to the next group and I said, I want you to do the same, I want you to do the same, I want you to do the same. I then ran a small encounter with one of the groups. Then by the time I got to the second group, they had their encounter ready. And then I moved on and I moved on. That's then great. used those encounters and literally just rolled random dice to determine which group fought whose encounter. Oh, and then fun. Then got that group to play the the NPC while that group played their characters. And I just simply moderated them based on the rules. So all the players actually secretly got to GM for a little right. while. Right. Um, and I had to come up with all of that and a decent mechanic for it in the span of like 10 seconds when these kids were walking through the door. So when you went back, Michael, after that and ran a game with four players, <laughs> what, what, what did you, what did you bring with you? So what did you have, what did that teach you at, to, to make you better at running a reasonable <laughs> session? Looking at that, one thing that I realized is that players love the idea of being able to influence the world. Yeah. They more than they enjoy creating their characters and having them sit around. One of the di big disconnects for players, I feel, is when they feel as though they are no longer a part of the world in one way, shape or form. Let's say, for example, that your character is a member of the guild, right? There is a big difference between being a guild patrolman and just sort of wandering around on a patrol. And then this stuff happens regardless of whether or not you're a part of it versus whether or not you are an individual who has the ability to influence what's happening. Cool, there's a there's a fire going on down the street and you see an arcanist running down the alleyway. What do you do? I want to save these people from the fire. Having the people then react to that, having the people yeah. deal with that, and then saying, cool, the uh, you by, by saving these people from this fire, um, later on down the track, you're chasing after this guy and uh, a random civilian knocks out the guy you're chasing. And it turns out it's this old woman with a flower pot in the street above because you saved her granddaughter from yep. the fire. Feeling as though you are a part of the world is what I learned from this because knowing that they set apart, apart this almost chain reaction so that something in the adventure is now different is the most important thing that you as a GM can provide to a player. God, the I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Is, is that, that, that sense of accomplishment is great. Like, yeah, killing the monster. Fantastic. Gaining loot or gaining experience and all that sort of stuff is always great, but there is no substitute from feeling like you have, creatively change the 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 story yeah and the phrase you'll hear a lot when people talk about this stuff is one they they want to be able to touch the world and, and and i think that's a great phrase because it makes it real right and that's your job as the gm is to make that real and the other phrase that i hear a lot um and i i hear it mis misused in my mind is there needs to be consequences there needs to be consequences to the actions your players take and that doesn't mean bad shit consequences are good things in your flower flower plot uh, fled, or that flower pot concept was a perfect example. That was a consequence. I did something earlier and then there was a consequence the next session, two sessions later that when that happens for a player, everything becomes real. Everything goes from black and white to color in those moments. So that's awesome. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to kind of touch on that as well, consequences is also not about punishing the characters right. with chips. Um, one of the things, and this is just, I guess, a generic role-playing game thing, especially in Through the Breach, because Through the Breach, of course, uses uh, a fate deck, which, of course, 54 cards, that's a set amount. You as a fate master do not want them to go through this deck quickly, because every time they go through the deck, they get to add a card to their hand of fate, which, of course, means that they have better odds to do stuff, you know, it means they have better things to do. So flipping like repeatedly, like, okay, make a check, make a check, make a check, make a check. Anytime something happens, you know, 
just simply cycles through the game, um, you, you know, quickly and unnecessarily. You don't want to be punishing the players by by trying to fish for failures. What you want to do is you want to accept what they do, and you want to make sure that good and bad, we get to see them yeah. influence influence things. Yeah, I think one of the best things that I learned, um, uh, and I've got a lot of leveling up to do. I'm a terrible GM now, but um, <laughs> one of the best things I uh, I uh, picked up was don't make don't don't have anybody do a check for something you don't want them to fail or, or you don't know what will happen if they fail. And, I, and the right. example you made was, was a couple segments ago when you said, you know, I want to climb up this and get up on top of the roof. Well then let them climb up and get on top of the roof. But if it's raining now, it gets interesting. Let's do a check because there could be narratively story-wise something interesting if they were to slip and fall now. Um, so that that's a big deal. Um, guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from the break, it's the uh, segment I'm really looking forward to because part of the reason that uh, me and Michael are here on this Tuesday before Gen Con is we've got some big news that's already been announced, but I want to give a little bit more details. So we'll be right back. Hi guys and girls, ladies and gents, I'm Kevin Smith, I'm the Southwest boy living in the southeast of the UK. I contribute $18 or £13 a month to Third Floor Wars. And why? Well, I work 50 hours a week as a supermarket manager, have three children, so in my spare time, I just want to play foe. And if I can't do that, the next best thing is listening to the Third Floor Wars podcast. Not only do I hear about what I play and the gaps in my knowledge, but I also hear about all of the cruising tactics that I need to beat and often how they've even performed in recent tournament reports. The online store has some great merchandise, including t-shirts and mugs to buy now to show your support. You should be a Patreon too. So pause this episode and go to patreon.com and search for Third Floor Wars, or grab the link in the show notes. What is it worth to you to get this podcast on a weekly basis? Is it worth a dollar a month? $5 a month? $20 a month? If you'd like to help support the work that we're doing here on Third Floor Wars, please go buy our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash thirdfloorwars. There you can pledge at any level, any dollar amount. Whatever you give us will help us put out quality content on a regular basis and hopefully make tabletop gaming a little bit better for you every week. Hey, want to take a moment to give a shout out to our most recent patrons, Nick Cromarty, Blair Thompson, Sean Ratner, Christopher Rue, Cody Ravicki, Nathan Howe, Brian Gresham, Max Adams, and Alec K. The only reason we're able to put out content on a regular basis is because of you and all of our other patrons. Thanks. So by the time this comes out, for us today, uh, the uh, Waldo's Weekly just came out, um, where finally both Michael and I could stop keeping our mouths shut and talk about how excited we are that we're partnering with Weird and helping uh, create some content for their online Gen Con. Um, And by the time this is released, it's going to be the Tuesday before Gen Con. So very quickly, for those of you that aren't aware, for Third Floor Wars, we've got two sessions on the coming Thursday, depending on when you're listening to this. But uh, the Thursday of Gen Con, I will be the moderator and interviewing both Matt and Kyle from uh, Weird Games Designers. And I'm going to find out as much as they'll tell me about the new Explorers. Um, So we're going to talk about what the idea of the Explorers is. We're going to dig deep into as much spoilers as I can get out of them. And I'm real excited about that. And then on Friday, we're going to move over to the third floor and we're going to do a live stream. And it's going to be the first game ever with Explorer models on the table and you guys will get to watch it. We've got two local players that you've heard of and seen on the live streams as well as on the uh, podcast. And uh, I'll be there. Ray's going to be there. And uh, we're going to find out exactly what uh, these Apex keywords can do in Explorers. But I want to talk about what I'm excited about, Michael, and that's Saturday because Saturday you have got some really neat things going on. Oh, yeah. No, Saturday we've got some very, very cool stuff going on. So I'll be sitting down with the uh, the writers for Through the Breach, um, which, of course, will include uh, Matt and Kyle, for those of you who uh, traverse the forums and, uh, and of course, uh, know the style, uh, know the writers, of course. Um, and we will be hopefully uh, answering people's questions on Through the Breach directly and in person, uh, as well as going over some of the experiences that I've had and some of the tips that I've got for running a smooth and fun game. Uh, in addition, we'll also be hopefully 
hopefully, fingers crossed, revealing some uh, some future content uh, that will be coming out for Through the Breach. And then, directly following, uh, I will be on the Mercs of Mischief, uh, the Dead Aussie Gamer, and the weird Twitch channel broadcasting a live Through the Breach game that will be featuring myself as the Fate Master and some very, very talented individuals, um, including, of course, uh, Janet from World Anvil, which we, uh, we mentioned earlier on. Um, as well as Till from Dungeon Fog, which is a map making software. Uh, again, very cool to to know about Dungeon Fog. If you, oh, I'm uh, a user. Make- I love them. Oh yeah, they're absolutely fantastic. So, uh, so Till, uh, as well as uh, Puck, who is of course the game master from the Mercs of Mischief. And uh, for those of you fans of role playing cinema, uh, from the Dead Gentlemen's and Zombie Orpheus Entertainment stable, we are going to be playing with Nathan Rice, the lead actor. Oh, sorry, a, a lead actor from uh, the Gamers Darkness Rising, uh, the Gamers actually, as well as um, Journey Quest. Uh, so a very, very famous actor there will uh, be joining us for his uh, for their Through the Breach, de- Breach debut. But of course, you know, that's that's only the people and, and, and that's exciting enough. But I'm going to reveal to you, of course, the uh, the generic theme of, of the, the session. And that is we are going to be playing with my favorite uh, Malifaux crew. And that is the Crossroads 7 will be. Oh will be a major part of the adventure. So you definitely want to check this out because I've been working tirelessly uh, with my crew and with the writers uh, to also include a uh, a through the, uh, sorry, a through the breach conversion for all members of the Crossroads 7. So you'll be able to uh, to utilize them uh, in the adventure. And much like um, much like the uh, Third Fall Wars, we will have raffles, we'll have prizes, we'll have things, and then a uh, another Q&A where you guys can talk to the actors at the very end of that segment. So um, yeah, definitely come along to Saturday and check that out. And, and for those of you listening, if you've never actually watched uh, actual play, so and, and I know many of you haven't, um, it's really a neat experience, especially if you're relatively new to role playing. And it's really neat to see how people run a game and how people get lost in the game. And what you're going to find is it's like reading a book and watching a movie all at the same time. So even though you're not playing, you get to hear the story and you get involved in the story. The only thing I'll caution you about is don't fall uh, for what is now being called the Mercer effect, because uh, what you're going to watch on Saturday is professionals, a professional fate master with professional players. Don't expect or don't hold yourself to that same standard. That's going to be something for you to shoot for. Go out and try this and have a lot of fun. Michael, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Um, I'd like to talk you into coming back again soon. Um, let's get, do some of the plugs real quick. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, um, on that note, I'd definitely love to come and talk uh, talk Malifaux as well as the Through the Breach stuff. Um, as for the plugs, of course, my name is Michael, and I am also known to the Dead Aussie Gamer. You can find me not only on twitch.tv slash Gamer and youtube.com slash Gamer, but you can find me on a whole bunch of other channels running a whole bunch of different shows. I have featured on How to Be a Great GM on a number of shows, uh, as well as on the Mercs of Mischief, where you can actually find my Through the Breach adventure uh, Avalon Society London Falls for those of you who are fans of the other side which of course is a great game that I think I mean maybe it's just me but I feel like it's an underplayed game it is it's a, it's a great it's a great game that that just that that had a lot you want to talk about twists of fate that had a lot of uh, black jokers thrown at it it's a great game oh yeah no I, I and honestly I, I love it and uh, for those of you who are fans of the other side um, the the London Falls adventure takes place during the uh, the the portals opening and the gibbering horde first arriving in uh, London at that time, so yeah, that is that is definitely a, a big big thing. I actually I I literally expressly bought the other side to run that game, and it was nice. so cool. It was it was so much fun, and yeah, um, definitely go check that one out because we've finished that first season, so that's all up and ready for you guys to check out. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me and all of my cool and awesome stuff. And guys, I'll have links to all of that, of course, in the show notes. Um, I have been watching Michael um, both on his channel and on other channels for a while. Um, and uh, it's worth your time. If you're a fan of Malifaux, even if you have no interest in ever playing through the breach, I guarantee you'll be entertained. Uh, so thanks again, Michael. Thanks for having me. All right. And for those of you that stuck around to the end, thanks for listening. Take care. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest gaming apparel and gear. While you're there, check out how the USFO Tour is shaping up. 
How does your conference compare to the others in the United States? Where do you rank nationally? Get those models built, painted, and on the table so we can see you at the U.S. Masters Invitational in October of 2020. Also, rate and write a review on this podcast for us. It really helps us find people almost as cool as you are. Thanks for listening. Howdy friend, Craig here. Is this episode making you realize you need to buy some models? Gadzooks Gaming is my favorite online retailer because of their large selection, killer prices, and great customer service. Don't you hate buying an entire crew box when you only need one model? Gadzooks sells crew box models individually and saves you a ton of money. They even have free shipping to the U.S. and Canada if you spend $100 or more. Swing by gadzooksgaming.com and make sure you tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. All the details are in the show notes. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast.